Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're so glad that you're able to join us. Hopefully you're able to get the uh, Wednesday night prayer bulletin in your email. Uh, and there you'll find all of our prayer requests and things to, uh, that's going on. And hopefully you'll take that and be in prayer for those of uh, us that need prayer. And so we just want to encourage you to get a hold of that. If you haven't got that, just contact one of us in the office and we'll get that to you. Uh, but now we're going to um, open up our Bibles. We're in the book of Colossians. We're in chapter two. This is our uh, we're going to continue on in our series here of Colossians, and uh, tonight we're going to talk about uh, warnings. Uh, God gives us warnings here in Scripture, and Paul uh, lays out three of them. And remember, Paul is writing this from prison to the Colossian believers, and they're struggling with some uh, false teaching in the church, and Paul is giving them some things to watch out for. You know, in life, we all have warnings. There's things um, uh, that we, we see every day that we kind of Look the other way. Sometimes the warnings are big. Sometimes they're small. Uh, we see things like construction zones. We see warnings, you know, watch out for construction workers. Watch out for an uneven road. Um, we have food allergy information. If you're allergic to something, you're going to make sure that uh, when you're eating something, that it's it, it doesn't contain that. And there's, uh, you know, beware of dog signs. There's warning signs everywhere. And especially right now with the coronavirus pandemic going on, you know, uh, Seems like when this all first started, they said, don't worry about wearing masks. It's not going to help you now. Everyone has to wear masks when you go out. Uh, it's funny, the other day, uh, me and Brooklyn were going out for a walk. We've been taking some long walks and trying to make the best of this. And we were walking and um, walking down the street. And a lady was on the other side of the street. And this is a, a pretty big street. It's the main street going through the neighborhood. So it's a very, it's a wide street. And the lady had a mask, but it was kind of, kind of around her neck. It wasn't on her mouth. And so she's probably 20, 30 feet away. She sees us and then puts her mask on as she walks past us by the street, about 20 or 30 feet away. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, I don't know, maybe me and Brooklyn look like we have coronavirus. I don't know. Uh, but it's kind of funny that that she decided when she saw us from 30 feet away, it was time to put her mask on. Um, you know, we have those warnings right now. Um, uh, when you go to theme parks, water parks, you know, Six Flags, Disney, you'll see warnings of who should or who should not ride the ride. Um, I, I told this story a couple of years ago when I was preaching, but it's pretty funny and and uh, it fits in the message uh, tonight. Uh, we were at Six Flags with our family down in San Antonio. And uh, of course, my Jen and my four kids are with us and we we're riding a water slide. Jen doesn't really do water slides, uh, the big ones like that. So we saw a water slide that can fit up to five people. I was like, great, there's me and four kids. We can go on that. And it had a weight limit. I can't remember what it was, but as I was doing the math, I quickly realized that uh, that we were way over the weight limit, right? Um, our kids are older, so they're not little kids anymore. And so we're, we're kind of going up the slide. I'm thinking to myself, man, I know we're probably probably a couple hundred pounds over of the, the weight limit. And uh, But in my mind, I'm like, hey, we'll probably go a lot faster. So it would be more fun to do. And uh, I did not heed the warning. And we get on the ride. It's a big, big circular raft. Maybe you've been on it before and we're going down and we're picking up speed pretty quick and it's really fun. And all of a sudden, uh, it wasn't fun anymore. We were going too fast. Um, Brooklyn almost went over the side of the of the slide. She was holding on for dear life and we went up one uh, big high bank and I was, old, I was, I was holding down on, I was looking down, almost getting ready to fall on one of my kids. Uh, and the, the thought going through my mind of, you dummy, why don't you heed the warning? It said not to exceed this weight limit, but but in my mind, it would be more fun. And while we still laugh about it today, it's been years ago, um, but uh, I should have heeded the warning the whole way down. I'm thinking, oh man, one of my kids is going to fall off. Jen's going to kill me for, for losing one of her kids on a water slide for being dumb. Uh, but thankfully, we uh, none of us died. It, it, we laugh about it now, but it was kind of scary going down. Um but there was a warning and I did not heed it. I did not uh, listen to the warning and they're there for a reason. Well, in life, God gives us lots of warnings throughout scripture. And if we're honest with ourselves, what we do is we say, yeah, that's good, but but that's for someone else, right? I know what I'm doing. I know what I can handle. And God, I know you give me this warning, but it's for, it's for someone else. Um, for our spiritual lives, we tend to get caught up in doing um, some physical things, right? We, we say my, my relationship with the Lord is great because I do this list of physical things. And here in Colossians, we're going to see that, that Paul gives us some warnings 
against that that mindset, against that that uh, that philosophy of religion of I'm good because I do lots of good things. And Paul really lays out some good warnings against that that we need to 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 take into consideration for our spiritual lives. And that's what we're going to focus on uh, tonight. And so we're going to read uh, in a couple of different sections here. Uh, we're going to start in Colossians 2. We're going to start in verse 16 and 17. And, and the first point is where Paul says, let no one judge you. This is the first warning that he gives uh, it, to us. He says, let no one judge you. Look at verse 16 and 17. He says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so here we see that that uh, the Lord, uh, through Paul, is, is exposing the dangers of legalism. He lists a couple things there. Uh, what was going on was the false teachers were uh, trying to mix Jesus plus the outward rules of the law. And I, in my studying, I found a quote um, that I like. And it says, legalism exists when people attempt to secure righteousness in God's sight by good works. Legalists believe that they can earn or merit God's approval by performing the requirements of the law. And I think what happens sometimes is uh, people mistake standards for legalism. And that's not the case. Uh, everyone should have good standards. Uh, the things, you know, for your family. You say, hey, we're not going to wear this. Uh, we're not going to watch us. We're not going to go to this place. Those are your standards that God has given you. Um, but but those things don't make you saved, right? And, and so a good way to, to kind of understand this is what legalism says is it's, uh, legalism says it's Jesus plus standards equal salvation. Um, and that's just not true. We know that our salvation is complete in Jesus Christ plus nothing else. Um, nothing wrong with having standards. We should all have them. Uh, but our salvation is not based on those standards. Uh, they don't make us more holy or righteous because we wear a certain thing, uh, because we don't go to a certain place, or, or we adhere to a, a, an earthly standard. Those things are good, and they're a result of salvation. It's not a proof of our salvation. And so I think a lot of, a lot of times we get that mixed up, and we, we fail to realize and the order of those things, that we get saved first. The Lord Jesus Christ works in our hearts, and then set standards in our life to make us live differently than the world. And we know that they don't affect our salvation. And so the, the basis for our freedom here um, is found in Jesus Christ. It's not the things that we do. And we need to remember that the law could never save us. Uh, you can never be good enough for God to love you more. You can never be good enough uh, to gain entrance into heaven based on your merits. It's just never going to happen. Uh, a lot of us, we like to think that we're good people. And, you know, we think that because I do good things, I'm a good person. When really, if we're honest with ourselves, we do a lot of bad things as well. We have a lot of bad thoughts and bad motives and we get angry and we do things that we, we shouldn't do. We, we react a certain way that which we shouldn't. Um, and the law was not there. Uh, to make us be better. In fact, it's the opposite. The law was there, according to Galatians, it's a schoolmaster. And the Bible says that the law was there to show us our desperate need for a savior. And that's exactly what the law does. And yet the false teachers back in the Colossian church there were saying that you can have Jesus plus the law. And, and those two things just can't mix. You can't be good enough to get Jesus. Uh, we need Jesus because we're not good enough. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Uh, that there's a danger of legalism setting in that they would say that you need to get saved, but you have to do all these little things in order to keep your salvation to make sure you're really saved. And that's just not the case. It's it's Jesus Christ plus nothing else equals our salvation. And we know that uh, legalism is bondage. Um, uh, in fact, Peter in Acts 15 calls it a yoke upon the neck. Let's look at that verse in Acts 15 verse 10. It says, now therefore, why tempt ye God? to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. You know, uh, here back in our in, in Colossians, in our, in our passage here, Paul mentions several regulations. He talks about the foods, the holy days, and the feasts, and all the things that they adhere to. Um, but what's interesting, for Old Testament, those laws, uh, the dietary laws, the feasts, and those type of things, they would set people apart physically. They were to show the rest of the world that we are God's people 
uh, physically. There are some physical things that we do, but today as Christians, uh, we're set apart by God's grace spiritually. It's no, it's not about the physical things we do. It's about who's inside of us. It's about who we are following, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet the physical things come after salvation. Uh, you'll never find someone in Scripture where they where they get good enough and then they're allowed to come to Jesus Christ. It's always the opposite way. It's they come to Jesus Christ, God changes them, and then they start the good works. And, and so it's a very important to remember because I know that's uh, it was a false teaching 2,000 years ago, and it's still the same today of people saying, um, you know, where I want to get saved, but I got to be good enough to get saved. I got to be good enough to keep my salvation. And that, that same lie is still around in, in different denominations today as well. But aren't we glad that we live in the age of grace? Man, praise the Lord. I know that, that my salvation is not based upon how good I am. Because I'll be honest, if, if I could, I would lose it, just like you would too. And if we're good enough to get our salvation, we're bad enough to lose it as well. And so I think that's what we need to realize, that, uh, that the law, like we talked about, was a schoolmaster. What it was there for is to show people that, hey, I demand perfection, God says, and there's nothing you can do to earn that. And so since you can't earn that, I'm going to make a way for you to get into heaven anyways, and that's through my son, Jesus Christ. And that's salvation through him. That's the only way uh, to God the Father is salvation in Jesus Christ. You can't be good enough. And so that first warning that Paul says here is uh, let, let no man judge you. Uh, the, the, the threat of legalism was getting in, and they were uh, falling into that trap of, yeah, you know what, maybe we should be good enough, and I got to get saved, and I got to do this and do that. And, and there was a big laundry list of things to do. And Paul says that's not the case at all. And so the second thing we see is Paul says in verse 18, he says, let no man beguile you of your reward. And so let's read those verses, verse 18 and 19. He says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, introducing unto those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. And so there's that word beguile again. Remember last week we took a look at beguile. I think it was in uh, verse four. Well, here in verse uh, 18, it's different. It's a different uh, different Greek word here. It's same, same English word, but different word in the original Greek. And what we see this word beguile means to declare unworthy of a prize. and uh, and it's an athletic term. It's kind of one where we get the picture of an umpire or a referee um, disqualifying a contestant because they have not obeyed the rules. And there's a couple, I'm a big sports fan. You can't see my office here behind me. I've got all kinds of Texas Rangers stuff. I've got bobbleheads and cowboy stuff. And uh, I love sports. I always have. And and so when, when I read this, a lot of things came to my mind of, of athletes being disqualified because of their actions or behaviors. There's some funny ones out there. If you, uh, This is a little before my time, but George Brett, when he got in trouble with the pine tar, he's a baseball player and he had too much pine tar on his bat. He hit a home run and it thought they went up in the game and it was the bottom of the, or the top of the ninth and they thought they were going to win the game. And, and it turns out he had too much pine tar on his bat. So the ump called him out. And uh, if you ever like watching some funny stuff on YouTube, that's a good one to look up. Uh, he gets really mad storming out of the dugout. The umpire called him out and because he had a little bit too much pine tar on his bat. Goes on, they end up making the game up later. It's a big, crazy story. Um, other examples, Reggie Bush, a football player, had his Heisman taken away because he was deemed unqualified back in college. And 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 so you think of Pete Rose, uh, one of the greatest baseball players of all time, uh, still banned from, from baseball and banned from the Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, years and years ago for gambling on baseball. And and so while those are all kind of goofy examples, we realize we get the idea that um, that they have done something wrong that has now banned them or banned them at the time from participating in that sport. It's taken some reward away from them, whether it be the Heisman Trophy or the Hall of Fame or something like that. Um, and, and so when we realize that they didn't really they didn't really lose the sport, they still got to play, but they lost their reward. And so as a Christian, you know, what can happen, we can get wrapped up in, in false religions and we can get wrapped up in, 
and, uh, and losing those things. We're not going to lose our salvation, but we can lose rewards. And when we get into false religions, and that's the, the warning here that Paul is, is giving us is the fact that Satan uses false teachers to beguile us, to, uh, to trick us and to also um, get us to not serve the Lord. And so while we can never lose our salvation, there's nothing we can ever do uh, to make God uh, not save us, right? We, to take our salvation away, but we can lose uh, relationships and we can lose our reward uh, for not serving him the way we should. And so how does Satan beguile us? How can he get us to not serve the Lord? Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we see in verse 13 and 14, it says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And what's interesting is that Satan has a way of making something bad for us look so good, doesn't it? It's amazing how in our own personal lives, we know what sin is, whether we struggle with a certain sin. We say, I'm never doing that again. Man, I can't believe I did that. And we pray about it and you know, God forgives and we get back with him. And, and yet here comes Satan again, tempting us, making us uh, think that that thing that we did was bad. is somehow good now. And we realize it's wrong, but we still do it, don't we? Uh, we're, we're tricked and we... Um, we, we get beguiled because, as the Bible says, that there, there's false apostles, deceitful workers, and Satan transforms himself into an angel of light and makes things look good. Uh, it's very deceitful. Um, and what they were they were holding, they were what they were doing is they were mixed up in this uh, idolatry. They were, um, verse 19 says, they were not holding the head. And so what that means is uh, they did not recognize Jesus Christ as God. The word to hold means to hold fast uh, to someone as to remain united with them. And so what they were doing, they were not remaining united with Jesus Christ. They were claiming him in their initial salvation. What happened, they were slowly drifting off to false doctrines. And uh, uh, Satan was beguiling, beguiling them of their reward. Um, and we, we realize that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. and But a cult makes the cult leader the head. And so that's a big difference there that I think we need to realize that everything that we do at Victory Baptist Church is to uh, to proclaim and promote Jesus Christ. Uh, we don't proclaim ourselves as ministers. Uh, we, we proclaim Jesus Christ. Uh, a false teacher will make themselves the head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. And we have an under shepherd, a, a pastor. We have staff. We have deacons and trustees and people that help out. And but we have one head of the church, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And and we do what He says according to what He's given us in His book. And as the uh, as servants of Him, we we proclaim Jesus Christ. We don't make ourselves the head. We make Him the head because He is the head. We exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, not people. And that's the exact opposite of what was going on here in Colossians. People were exalting themselves. And telling people that they can worship the Lord by obeying them, not what the Lord Jesus Christ had said. But here at Victory Baptist, we always try to do what the Lord Jesus Christ says to do through the revelation of, of his word. And so the third thing we see is that uh, Paul, through the Lord, says, let no one enslave you. So we know, let no one judge you. Let no one beguile you of your reward. And also let no one enslave you. Look at verse 20. He says, wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, you are subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all things, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. And so a couple things to, to really point out here uh, is that we have died with Christ. And the, the expression to die here was to be free from something. It's to be free from something. When we died with Christ, we're free from the penalty of sin. And praise the Lord uh, that one of these days that we know we all are going to die. Not something that we, we like to think about, but praise the Lord. We know that there is no penalty for our sin and death. We will die because of our sin, but because of Jesus Christ, if you know him as your Savior, you'll live with him uh, for eternity in heaven with the Lord. And so the reason we know that is because that Jesus Christ paid our debt. And I know we've talked about it in the past, but no amount of self-effort and works can accomplish that. And what these people were teaching, they were saying that you can get saved 
but to make sure you're really saved and, 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 you know, to make sure you're saved, you have to do a bunch of things. And the reason I need to be saved is because I can't do all those things. The same for you. I am not perfect. I cannot, uh, I can't do everything the Lord wants me to do because I have a sin nature and these false teachers, um, whether they didn't understand it or they didn't want to believe it, they just didn't get it. They were, they were saying that it's Jesus plus something else, but we know that no amount of, of, of self effort of self discipline, uh, can make us good. Um, the old man is dead. And Jesus Christ, and we are a new creature. In fact, I love this scripture. Most of you know it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And praise the Lord for that, um, that I'm not judged on my past. Now, my past might give me uh, earthly consequences. Uh, you might have done some things in your life that... Uh, and then gotten saved, but are still maybe dealing with some earthly consequences of your sin. That, that's a natural thing that, that we have to, to pay the price for. But spiritually speaking, I don't have to pay the eternal punishment of hell because of my sin. That punishment has been paid. That debt has been paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here that, that we are dead with Christ in the rudiments of the world. And uh, the rudiments of the world, those are the false worldly religious views um, they mixed grace plus good works, which we've talked about. That uh, we should not subject ourselves to those legalistic ordinances. And then he goes into verse twenty-one. He, in parentheses, there we see it says, "Touch not, taste not, handle not," which are all uh, are to perish with the using. And what's interesting here is we know that that false religions and false teachings always have a list of rules to follow, don't they? I think about all the, the major religions out there, um, there's always a list of things to do to make sure you're saved. Praise the Lord, Christianity is not a list of rules. There's one rule, and that's to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and to live for Him. And I am so thankful that, uh, that God does not give us um, a list of rules that, that make sure that we're saved. Now, God gives us lots of rules in Scripture and he says, if you'll do this, I will bless you. But it all starts with the knowledge of, of having Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, our relationship with the Lord, our Heavenly Father, is based on our relationship with Jesus Christ, the Creator. And uh, what was happening, these, these false teachers were, uh, they'd taken the law and added a whole bunch to it. Uh, they would say, uh, there's all these little rules you can never memorize enough of them. You would uh, accidentally break tons of rules and laws every day because uh, the list was ridiculous. There's things you could do, things you couldn't do. Um, every little detail of their life was uh, tied to a rule that they, they tried not to break. But we realize that our faith is placed in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's not a list of rules. Now, God gives us lots of rules to live by, uh, and he gives us lots of warnings, just like uh, my boneheaded mistake probably almost got several of my kids killed on a water slide. It's funny now, wasn't so funny going through it whenever I almost, you know, fell off the slide and kids fall off the slide. But ultimately that was my fault, right? God gives us rules to live by. We see them, we see these warnings and they're not to, to gain our salvation, but they're to make our life better. God is not out to, to give us a boring life. God wants us to have an abundant life. He says of, of joy and God wants to bless us, but we have to do things his way. What happens is we start to do our things our own way and our life gets messed up pretty quick, doesn't it? If we'll just, if we'll run our marriages the way Bible, the Bible says to, if we'll raise our kids the way the Bible says to, it'll be so much better. The problem is, is we, we read these warnings, we read these things that God gives us. And what do we say? We say, I think I know better than the Lord. Our pride sets in. And how foolish is that? Uh, to think that we know better than what the Lord says. But before we close tonight, just ask the question, what is your faith placed in? Um, the faith of the, the false teachers was placed in Jesus plus a bunch of other stuff, a, a list of rules to follow, a list of things to wear, a list of things not to touch, a list of places not to go. Um, you know what? You can make a list uh, and try to follow it uh, your whole life and you'll never be perfect. And so what is your faith placed in? Uh, for me, it's the Lord Jesus Christ and his completed work on the, on the cross of Calvary. Um, there's nothing I can do to add or take away from that. 
if it's placed in things that you're doing for the Lord, man, I encourage you to take another look at your faith. Take another look at what scripture says about following the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about being a good person. It's about realizing I'm not a good person and I need Jesus Christ to save me. Uh, is your faith placed in church attendance? Aren't you glad that uh, that that we're not uh, you know held accountable uh, for our salvation for church attendance? I think we're coming up on our fourth uh, Sunday or so here in a, a week or two. I, honestly, I lost count of how many Sundays we've missed. I don't like it. I'd rather be preaching to you physically and shake hands with you and hug you and do all those things. Um, but aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't say, if you'll go to church X amount of days in a row, you're saved? Because let's face it, we haven't been to church in probably about a month now. And so where would that put our salvation? Now, church is great. God commands us to go. We can't go right now. Um, so we get to do things like this. Uh, it, it's not near as good, but it's the best thing that we have. But the, the point is that is that if your life is is based on a checklist of spiritual things, you'll never check all those things off. You'll never be good enough. I'm glad that it's not based on church attendance. I'm glad it's not based on uh, doing certain things because let's face it, uh, this pandemic kind of uh, uh, blows that out of proportion. We, we can't go to church and we can't see each other. We can't do a lot of things. And so, but you know what? Even though I can't come to church right now, uh, my salvation is still secure. There, I have not lost my salvation. God doesn't love me any less. Uh, God understands. In fact, and God uh, still wants to bless me and my family and you and your family if you'll just obey him and do what he says to do. And so to kind of close up, I just want you to think of those three warning signs that God has given us here. Uh, just like everyday warnings, we tend to overlook them. I mean, how many times have you, you know, uh, looked at a some kind of label that says warning, you say, ah, that's for someone else. Or you, you drive past a, uh, you know, a construction zone and not even paying any attention. We all do that. I encourage you when you're reading scripture, don't just blow past the warnings of God. They're there for a reason. God knows all about you. He knows all about your life and what you need to do to fix your life and what make, and to how to make it better. And so God has given us those three warnings. I'll go over them again. He says in verse 16, let no one judge you. And that's dealing with the bondage of legalism. Don't get stuck in that. And don't get trapped into that. And he says in verse 18, let no man beguile you of your reward. Uh, don't have a counterfeit religion. Don't let someone uh, kind of steal you away and and risk losing your, your faithful rewards of Christ. And in verse 20, he says, let no one enslave you. To realize that Christianity is not some list of rules to put you under the, the yoke of bondage again. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful that I have one. And I pray that most of you have one as well. And if and if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to uh, just to pray and to ask the Lord uh, to save you, to come in your heart and, and to and you, the con, uh, convict you, confess your sin. And then he will do that and he will remove your sin. He'll, he'll forgive you and he'll save you. And uh, just pray that you would do that uh, before it's too late. And so as we're close, just let me pray. And then I will ask the Lord, uh, to again uh, bless us tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have to uh, just to meet together virtually here over the internet and thank you for the tools that we have. And God, I thank you so much for your word and uh, just for the uh, the truth that it is, not only the truth that it contains, but it is truth. And God, I just thank you for the warnings that you give us. And here's we and we saw in Colossians chapter two that you've laid out three very specific warnings for the Colossian believers thousands of years ago, but they also ring true for us today to uh, to make sure that we're not um, placing our faith in Jesus Christ plus something else for our salvation. But God, we know it's through Jesus Christ and, and, and no one else. God, we thank you for blessing us. Thank you for giving us a Bible to study and to read. And God, I pray that as we have these warnings in our lives, these spiritual warnings, that we would take them seriously. Help us to um, to, to realize that they're there for a reason, that you want to bless us, you want us to have a, a blessed and joyful life, and it only comes with obeying you. We just thank you again for our time to meet together tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, amen. Well, thanks for joining us tonight. We're just looking forward to the time we can physically meet together again, and we're just looking forward uh, to that day, hopefully very soon. And I uh, just want to encourage you to uh, to stay linked in and with us on our YouTube videos and, and our Facebook and our website, all those different things to stay connected. And uh, we will see you next Sunday. Hi there. Thanks for tuning into the Victory Baptist Church YouTube channel. We hope this message was a blessing to you. If it was, 
we'd ask that you'd subscribe down below and click the bell. That way you can be notified the next time we upload a video. If you'd like to hear more from Victory Baptist Church, we invite you to our website, victorybyfaith.org, where you can see our past sermons, our different ministries, and our service times. Because once we are able to gather together, we'd love to have you come and visit. Until then, have a great day and God bless.